This is really an amazing event, especially for somebody who's a director of population centers to focus on this issue. So nine billion people, nine billion, it sounds like a lot of people, and it is a lot of people. But if you were a scientist working in the 1960s when we first started to think about population problems, the projections were far worse, far, far worse. In many ways, we're in a great position today. And it's all because something happened. Well, what happened? What happened during this period? Um, we are in the midst of one of the biggest transformations in human history in terms of population. Uh, for almost all the time that anybody could count, there have been more children on the earth than old people. We think this is the way it is. Well, it isn't anymore. 2015 is the midpoint of a demographic transformation in which there are going to be more people who are over 60 than under five. We know nothing about how to plan a society in which there are so many older people and so few young children. Will this be good? Will it not be good? How will it really work? So population, just in terms of background, is completely and totally determined by two things, two conditions alone. One is births, that is the number of people and babies who are born in the earth. Uh, we call that a fertility rate, and deaths or mortality, the number of people who die. It's only those two things that determine all of population. If you live in a country, the other thing that determines population is migration. But let's just think about the globe for a while, about the Earth. So what happens is that for most of history, death rates were really high and birth rates were really high. So for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, basically we were in equilibrium. That is, a lot of people were born and a lot of people died, and we kind of stayed steady. And then something started to happen. First, what happened is death rates actually decreased. Now, everybody's going to die. We haven't figured out the cure for that yet. But we do think about death rates. And they started to fall. That is, people started to live longer. And then somewhere along the line, actually birth rates started to drop as well. And suddenly, we had a disequilibrium. And one way to think about that disequilibrium is to put it in the perspective of doubling times. So if you think about how long it took for the world to double originally, when we first started thinking about this maybe seven or 800 years ago, it took the world 500 years to double the first time. 500 years. The second time, it took us 150 years. You can see where this is going, right? The third time, it took us 70 years to double in population. This is when population scientists got really, really um, concerned. And then in 1960, between 1960 and 1999, 39 years, we went from 3 to 6 million. Now, that got everybody's attention. And that's when population centers around the world started um, popping up. And we started to think, we're going to be overrun. We're going to be overrun with us, not other things, us. We're going to overrun the planet. And people became really alarmed. Now, the question is, think about it. We've gone from 500 to 150 to 70 to 39. It's really logical to know what the next number is, right? <laughs> it doesn't take a really rocket scientist to start to worry that 20 is the next number. Or if you all know a little bit now that birth rates are dropping, maybe you think it isn't 20, maybe you'll think it's 39. Well, actually, population scientists think something else completely different. We're off by a huge number. It looks like now it will take 100 years for us to double population from 3 to 6 to 6 to 12. And one of the recent past presidents of the Population Association has an even more statistical term for this. He says, never... How about never? Never are we going to reach 12 billion people. It's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because birth rates have dropped so much. So during this time, birth rates have really dropped. 
and death rates actually have also dropped, le leading to longer lives. And our growth rate has changed enormously. So we now need to rethink completely how we've thought about population. We're not like in Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, where we thought the world would come to an end. Something else completely is going on. So I want to show you one um, small animation of growth rates. Um, over time across the globe. And what you'll see along the bottom um, axis actually is time, and on the top axis is the growth rate. And here it goes. So 1800, up, 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 you see it? Up, up. And then look what happens. It falls. And the projections are that by 2050, this is going to be lower than actually it was during periods of 1800 or 1850. So our growth rates have changed enormously. And I want you to remember this is not population size, which has kept growing. This is a growth rate, right? So you can see why everybody was incredibly worried in 1960 and through 2000, and then something else happened. So this is driven largely by drops in birth rates. And what do we think has dropped birth rates? Well, we don't actually know very much about what's dropped birth rates, but we do know a few things. One is birth control definitely helps um, when we're thinking about this, but most importantly, we think that economic development and basic advances in public health infrastructure have driven drops in birth rates. Now, why would that be? So what's happened is that children started to survive. So with the survival of children, people started investing in children, and children became expensive. You are very expensive, but actually so are a lot of other people in Africa and India and Asia. As population drops, children become very expensive, and families want to invest in them, so they invest in education, they invest in their health, and as they start to survive, and it looks like, in fact, you don't have to have 16 children to have one or two survive, people don't have so many children children, and in fact, the birth rate decreases, and we have a much healthier, longer society. So what makes this diagram actually work is a very logical kind of drop in birth rates. We also think that um, policies, the one-child policy in China, budge this in some ways, although it's been hugely controversial now to watch what China has done as it has relaxed the policy and thought about a two-child policy. Are people going to go out? Well, I think the obviously the we don't know yet what's out, what's going to happen, but most people think that actually public health and economic development now drive population, and in China, children are hugely expensive in working families. So we probably will not see a huge blip in that. So let's move on to thinking about what this drop in birth rate means as we start to think about the demography of aging. So age population structure is the major tool of demographers. And instead of calling these age distributions, usually demographers call them pyramids because for as long as we know, remember there were more babies than old people, things looked like a pyramid during this time. And then slowly, slowly, as birth rates dropped and people lived longer, this changed. So I want to show you a couple of videos from the UN on changes in demographic profiles. And I'm going to show you one for the globe and one for a couple of countries so you get the hang of um, what you'll see here. So what you see above is um, the population for the world. And what you're seeing is it's now at 2000, 2010, 2020. We'll let it run all the way through again. 2040, 2050, you see this rectangularization. So here's 1950, right? Lots of children. Then you see like baby boomers working their way up. And what you see below it, however, is not a replacement. It sort of stays at the same way so that sooner or later we have this kind of rectangularization. So again, you see the United States, the globe um, through this time as it's moving through this demographic transition between 150, which is the first one, and we're almost reaching their projections of 2050 here. So let's try the United States. You can see what the United States looks like. 
So this is the US, I think. Yeah. And there you really see baby boomers, right? This is like the uh, boa constrictor who swallowed the rat um, for this. But interestingly, it's not just baby boomers. You don't see it re being replaced. It's not the rat going through the boa constrictor. It looks the same all the time. So you see what happens is this huge rectangularization. And we can look at it for China. You're going to see the same idea. This is China as it goes through. And you can actually see this is one child policy at each of those squozen <laughs> spots there. You'll see China. And even in China, you see this rectangularization happening very quickly because in part of this very strict um, drop in birth rates. And finally, I just want to show you one country where this has not happened. There are several countries in Africa that have not experienced this kind of demographic transition. I'm going to show you one for Uganda, which in fact is one of the poorest countries and one of the countries with highest fertility in the entire world. Here is Uganda. And what you can see is actually very little change. So it's not like every country has undergone this, but almost every country. There's a handful, mostly of sub-Saharan African countries, where fertility remains very high, and you don't see this demographic um, kind of rectangularization. But by and large, the rectangularization of the world in terms of demography is here with us to stay. It doesn't look at all like it's going away. So what does that mean? What does actually that mean for a society in which all our policies, all the way we've thought, all the way the whole entire world thinks is there's going to be lots of kids and very few old people? Well, how are we going to reimagine this? How are we going to think about, well, what is going to happen in a world that looks dramatically different from anything that we've ever planned? And I often say to people that you know this. It's like in, in lots of ways what I'm saying is not new. You know this, but you don't know this. You don't honestly incorporate this into how you think about different policies. So let's think about three challenges that aging societies are going to have. One has to do with ensuring that the population is healthy, that we have increasing healthy life expectancy, and that we have a way of reducing inequalities in health, not increasing inequalities in health. So over time, a lot of the evidence is that with increasing life expectancy, that is, the longer people live, actually people have by and large become healthier during that time. And we call that healthy life expectancy and a compression of morbidity. So what we'd all like is to be really healthy and then drop dead, right? That would be the way most of us would choose to go if we had that choice. Um, and it looks like things are moving along that way. However, there's some evidence now that generations of people in their 30s and 40s and 50s may not actually be as healthy as the generations um, that preceded them which would mean that we might have increases in life expectancy, but we could have many sicker years. And perhaps more important than actually the idea that generations over time might not experience the same benefits that older generations have is the idea that we might have widening health disparities, that um, people who are poor, who lack resources, who have less education, have far grimmer outcomes than people who are better educated. So we have widening inequalities. In the United States, when we couple this with racial and ethnic disparities, we see that not only do, for instance, African Americans and several other ethnic groups experience um, disadvantage in terms of health, but they probably have a historical legacy of those experiences as well. So it's going to take a long time. So one of the biggest threats that we have and challenges is how to deal with widening inequalities in health, what that will mean, and at the same time, continuing to move forward in terms of healthy life expectancy. Second challenge. Um, second challenge is a hard one to say because we have a lot of age-related silos. We have a lot of to-dos. Oh, we do this when we're 20. We do this when we're 30. We do this when we're 40. We have a lot of expectations. And those silos were functional when people didn't live very long, when women weren't in the labor force, when uh, we pretended it was 1940. These things worked really well. So we got a lot of education when we were young and young adults. And then we stopped education. Like, that's it. It's over. Now we're going to work. And then we like 
in the United States, but all over the place, the United States especially, we work like crazy, right? So middle age, this middle adult set of years, people work like crazy, crazy, crazy. They also happen to have families during that time. That's another one of the things that happens in middle age, usually. And then we get to old age. And really, old age, we have an undefined set of roles. Mostly people just died, right? So we didn't have to deal with old age very much. But that's me, actually. That's me in that third bin. And um, I think I'm not, knock on wood, dying. And it's unclear what the roles are. Certainly, I am not playing golf for the next 20 or 30 years. I don't even know how to play now. So the odds of me learning how to do this are very, very slim. But those sets of roles for old people won't work. So nobody imagined that you would survive another 10, 20, 30 years, right? That bin is very empty with what we're supposed to do. So we need to reimagine that. But the truth is actually more important than it is for old people. This siloed way of behaving is not good for anybody. The truth is it doesn't work for young people, it doesn't work in middle adulthood, and it doesn't work in old age. And that's because education that once was serving its purpose and you could count on it ending and it would serve you well for your life, it doesn't work anymore like that. It doesn't work like that for people who are working in factories or manufacturing jobs, and it doesn't work for people who are um, academics or in any other thing. Lifelong education is going to be really important. The odds of us needing to retool, all of us, and globally all of us, are very high. So that bin doesn't really work. The middle age bin where we work, 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 and by the way, we raise families, um, that bin isn't so terrific either, right? Because, in fact, sometimes it isn't really terrific to work, work, work. We need to take time out to raise families. We may be sick. Um, it would be really good to borrow some of the leisure from old age and put it into the bucket in middle age and then spread out our working lives longer. But that requires a whole new way of thinking about work. And then finally, of course, comes the old age one. So we need to rethink about that. And then finally, the last challenge has to do really with thinking about work um, and our working lives. So when Social Security was um, developed in mid-1930s, um, life expectancy was about 60. Most people never lived to get Social Security um, at that point. Or they did it and they got it for a few years. They never got it for 10 or 20 or 30. Now, life expectancy, if you reach 65, your life expectancy for a man is 19 and for a woman is 21. That's a lot of years to be getting Social Security, so no wonder our Social Security group is in trouble. But more than that, we need to rethink how we're going to work. But as we think about work, we're a very heterogeneous group of people. Some of us, around here mostly, can afford to work and will want to work for a very long time. And work is very health-promoting, so it's probably a good thing to do. Other people will be in really arduous jobs, and they will not be able to continue working. They'll have disability. They'll have worked really hard lives. They're going to need another option, and not an option that makes them Roleless. So as we rethink work and retirement, it poses a whole new set of challenges. So these three things, I think, are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, as we think about the world, the world is getting bigger slowly. It's getting older very rapidly. And the important thing to, for us to think about, and the challenge, and I think you posed it really well, is that demography is not destiny. Demography is just a fact. It's our response to demographic change, uh, transitions that determines how successful we will be, how sustainably we'll create um, the planet, how successfully and resiliently we will leave the world for not only our children, but probably our children's children's children. Thank you. Thank you.